right in front of you. Hello. Good evening. Can you all hear me okay? Excellent. So my name is Margie Cook. I'm part of the team that brings you live from NYPL. And I want to say hello to everyone who is watching right now, those of you in the room and those of you watching online. There are many things you can do with your time, so I'm grateful that you chose to spend it here because we have a special night in store for you. I'm so proud and honored to welcome the Lenape Center and contributors to a Lenape Hoking Anthology, a book of essays, and so much more that explores the personal journeys of people seeking welcome in their ancestral homeland. Um, and the anthology will be available for everyone in this room to take home, courtesy of the Lenape Center. Um, and of course, if you have a New York Public Library card, you can also check it out for free. So in a moment, I'm going to turn it over to tonight's moderator. But before I do, I'd like to tell you about some of our upcoming events in the days and weeks ahead. So this Wednesday, we're delighted to welcome Reginald Betts and Titus Kafar, who will discuss their joint artistic and literary project, Redaction, which confronts the abuses of the criminal justice system with philosopher Jason Stanley. You can still join us virtually on March 13th for a conversation on ethics and public art with Lori Anderson, Fardale Baez, Walter Hood, and Justin Garrett Moore in partnership with the Academy, American Academy in Rome. And we also still have live stream tickets available for our program with British science journalist Angela Saini, who will discuss her new book, The Patriarchs, a groundbreaking exploration of gender depression, its origins, and our efforts to combat it on March 14th with Nona Aronowitz. Again, in-person tickets are sold out, but live stream tickets are available. And last, but certainly not least, after a three-year hiatus, Library After Hours is back. Join us for an exclusive After Hours access and celebration of Women's History Month with a special peek into the lives and work of some of the most iconic women in our collections. So be sure to register at nypl.live, and we hope to see you there. Live from NYPL is made possible by the continuing generosity of Celeste Bartos, Minaz Ispahani Bartos, and Adam Bartos. And of course, by all of you, our wonderful supporters near and far. Thank you for that support, and thank you again for being here. Now, I'm so pleased to introduce Cora Fisher, arts writer and curator of visual arts programming at the Brooklyn Public Library, who will moderate tonight's conversation. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for the land we're on, living Lenape Hoking. Thank you, Margie, for your warm introduction, and thank you to New York Public Library for hosting us this evening. What we are about to experience is nothing short of a public re-education 
and a look at the work of Lenape Center in reorienting culture and challenging the prevailing settler colonialist myths and existing narratives of the land we are in, Lenape Hoking, the an ancestral homeland of the Lenape people. The mission of Lenape Center is continuing Lenape Hoking, the Lenape homeland through community, culture, and the arts. And since 2009, they've created programs, exhibitions, workshops, symposia, land acknowledgement, and ceremonies pushing back against erasure. They are seeding the ground, both literally and figuratively, with Lenape consciousness for the next generations. Lenape Center is comprised of visionaries who are demanding nothing less of us than a reckoning with reality and history so that we may begin the collective work of change, or if we've begun it, to continue it. I have had the great luck of being mentored by Joe Baker, Curtis Zuniga, and Adrian Kumans, who, along with the composer Brent Michael Davids, are the beating heart of Lenape Center. So I'm here because in 2022, in partnership with Brooklyn Public Library, Lenape Center mounted the first Lenape curated exhibition in a New York City public institution at Brooklyn Public Library, along with a host of radical and watershed programs, which drew visibility and attention to the issue of missing and murdered indigenous people. They debunked the myth of the purchase of Manhattan, shared medicinal plant wisdom and work with seeds, and demonstrated masterworks of Lenape art and culture. So the message is clear. Lenape are here, the culture is alive and pulsing, and we have a great responsibility and also very good fortune to learn. So the anthology that we're gonna share tonight, edited by Joe Baker, Adrian Kumans, and Joel Whitney, who's in the audience today, and supported by the Accomplice Collective and the Rubin Foundation is an outgrowth of this transformative work of Lenape Center and an example of how public libraries can and indeed must work in partnership to dismantle and root out prevailing gaslighting and deception of America's real origins, which have, as many of us know, resorted to genocide forced removals, slavery, extraction, and the continued invisibilizing of indigenous people and perspectives. The work of free access, knowledge, circulation, culture, and social nurturing is also the work of libraries and provides a space for what has so long been overdue. Our distinguished panel tonight includes Joe Baker, executive director and co-founder of Lenape Center, as well as he's also an artist, educator, curator, and activist. We are also joined by Curtis Zuniga, co-director and co-founder of Lenape Center, as well as a former Lenape chief and specialist in Delaware Lenape culture, language, and traditional practices and Adrian Kumans, co-director and co-founder of Lenape Center and an adopted member of the white Turkey, Turkey Fugate family, as well as the co-editor of Lenape Hoking and Anthology. So if you, you find in your seats a program, you can read more about our distinguished guests and the breadth and depth of their visionary leadership. So now, please welcome Joe Baker. Gatakeku, Lue Yuka, Yukwe, Enda, Lakwi, Lakwi, Nulalentum, Ilepayak. I want to say something on this evening. I'm glad because you people came. My name is Joe Baker. I'm an enrolled member of the Delaware Tribe of Indians, whose headquarters are located in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. 
I'm co-founder and executive director of Lenape Center, which was established in 2009 to push back against the erasure of our presence in Lenape Hokie. I'm a member of the Simon White Turkey family whose family arrived in Indian Territory in 1867 from our last Federal Reserve in and around the town of Florence, Kansas. I am a direct line descendant of Lenape leaders, including my third great grandfather, Captain Anderson Sarkoxy, 1784 to 1876, a signer of the Treaty of Greenville. Fourth great grandfather, way up, uh, uh, squing, way up squing way, white eyes, 1730 to 1778, who negotiated the first treaty with the U.S. government in 1778, the Treaty of Fort Pitt, which was to establish an all Lenape 14th state with representation in Congress. Fifth great grandfather, King Newcomber, 1686 to 1776. Sixth great-grandfather, Chief Nudimus, 1650 to 1756, whose English name was Turkey, who signed the confirmation deed for the walking purchase under uh, protest. And my seventh great-grandfather, Taminan, King Tammany, 1625 to 1701, who negotiated the peace treaty with William Penn. As in the rest of the country, New York City is going through a racial and cultural reckoning. Everything from reckoning with looted artifacts in museums, Confederate and colonial monuments to oppressors and white supremacists, and printed and spoken land acknowledgments, alerting audiences to the plunder that North America's cities like New York are founded upon. Such actions call for the questioning of the meaning of territory within the colonial framework of private ownership. Just as Nora Thompson Dean broke the silence of 400 years of separation from the homeland, Lenape Center continues to shape the future of our understanding of place in the public consciousness. Founded in 2009, Lenape Center is a nonprofit arts and cultural organization whose mission is to continue Lenape Hawking, the Lenape homeland, through community, culture, and the arts. Based in Manhattan and led by Lenape elders, Lenape Center has created programs, exhibitions, workshops, symposiums, and land acknowledgments. Territory can extend beyond the frame of real estate to include a cultural space which can shape ideas and transform one's understanding of history and the understanding of place. No discussion of this idea of Lenape culture can be attempted without referencing the Lenape virtues, which inform every aspect of the spirit and energy of Lenape lifeways. These same virtues play significantly in the behavior and conduct re regarding all of life's expressions. Lenape values that have been fostered through sentiment and love within traditional families contributing to the health and welfare of a greater community. The Lenape virtues. Humility of spirit and conduct exemplary, sincere behavior toward man, clean living, sobriety, 
altruism. Consideration of the elderly and all people, those who are different from you. Opposition of all forms of violence. A commitment to a lifestyle that promotes physical health and well-being. While our museum world is buzzing about the looting of world cultures, what about the silence and erasure of the original people of New York, the Lenape? Why have the city's many museums and cultural organizations failed to honor this history? The Smithsonian going so far as to declare, quote, the Lenape can never come home, end quote while their National Museum of the American Indian rests on the actual footprint of the Dutch Fort Amsterdam, the colonizers who set in motion a philosophy of the outsider by building the wall to keep the Lenape out, a metaphorical gesture that extends to the present day. But this may be changing due to the bravery and the tenacity of my co-workers and co-directors of Lenape Center who have been working to expand our awareness of cultural space. Four individuals who have been knocking on the cultural doors of the city of New York for over 14 years recently found a friend at the Brooklyn Public Library. Lenape Hawking the first Lenape curated exhibit in New York at Greenpoint Branch, opening in January 2023, and the recent anthology of essays by Lenape scholars, historians, community members, artists, and others is changing history. An anthology that sets the record straight, helping to combat the ongoing violence still being committed against indigenous people and tribal lands today. The first ever publication to include first person voice is making way for a new scholarship of Lenape presence, both past and present. It is being included in the courses at Columbia University Teachers College, uh, SUNY Purchase, as well as being distributed at the Brooklyn School of Law. Other museums, including the Morgan Library and Museum and the American Museum of Natural History, are making way for Lenape featured exhibits in the coming years. And Federal Hall, National Museum of the American Indian's neighbor, while sharing space on Wall Street, is including Lenape voice for the first time ever in their upcoming celebration of George Washington and the formation of the United States government. This anthology will be made not only available to you tonight, but available to teachers and the general public to provide a true and accurate history of the genocide and foundational acts that would become the United States. For all New Yorkers, this is a game changer, providing new insights into how one's experiences daily life in the city, the ancestral homeland of the Lenape. The site of first contact, the Lenape narrative animates the entire island and all five boroughs. Another change maker is the course Land Kentawakan Lenape Lifeways at Columbia University School of Social Work. Taught by myself and Adrian Cummins, it is our hope that the course offers a means of navigating the turbulent waters caused by short-term thinking and disconnectedness from Earth. It has been challenging to secure this course within the curriculum. However, the values and importance of the course was recently demonstrated as is always the case through the clean, brilliant minds of students. And I want to share those thoughts with you tonight.
this is a response to the um, Lenape laws. Number one, Lenape law. We are all relatives, respect all relatives. This Lenape value stresses the interconnectivity of all things. Indeed, the land, the sky, and all life exist as interdependent, interconnected web where no single element or being was void of its own place and embodied spirit. This represents an appealing alternative and solution to the toxic individualism created by colonial capitalist society today. We as a species have largely forgotten the right relationship we once had with Earth, while those who do remember have been stripped of the agency necessary to maintain that relationship. In short, when we left, the land noticed. Recognizing and remaking those connections are necessary to healing. Number two, think good thoughts when we speak. This Lenape value stresses the importance of intentionality. For native languages, words create reality. They spawn it and are considered generative. The phrase, speak something into existence, is not theoretical for many indigenous people. But the generative power must be coupled with the goodness of thought. It is perhaps unsurprising how destructive broken treaties have been for the Lenape. Not only do they represent a collapse of trust, but they also stand as testament to the Dutch, British, and American, uh, and Americans saying the right things, but say, thinking bad thoughts. Good action cannot ultimately come from good words informed by bad thoughts. One must fully embrace and dedicate themselves to the words they speak. Otherwise, what are they worth? Number three, everyone has the ability to heal. This Lenape value stresses the capacity of all things to be whole again. Kay Green offers seeds as a model for preservation as they are lost relatives with cultural resonance that can heal the historical trauma of separation from home and er an erasure of presence. No matter the harm perpetuated or the time elapsed, no amount of fragmentation and annihilation can externally incapacitate. Like seeds, we all carry with us the opportunity for regrowth. Culture is resistance. And from culture to may healing happen. We as a global society must no longer play favorites in whom we afford the opportunity to heal and what extent. In closing, as we reflect upon these Lenape values, let us remember that healing ultimately means reclaiming our right to be who we are. For the Lenape, this act of reclamation requires a return to the homeland, a return to the arms of Mother Earth, who have held our people for time immemorial, and the true recognition of our territory, Lenape Hawking. Let us each strive every day to give grace to all of life's wonders and our families, our children, our friends, our neighbors. Only then can we foster an environment of healing. One is she.
Everybody wave hello. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm going to send that back to Oklahoma. That's right. That's beautiful. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, Adrian. It's great to be with you. It's an honor to sit with you. Um, I want, before we turn the mic to Curtis so he can share um, some of his contributions to the anthology, I want to start with a kind of general observation and question. Um, the observation for me is that this publication is born in part out of both an extreme lack and an extreme surplus. A lack in the sense of, you know, I remember when we were in one of our group meetings working on the exhibition at Brooklyn Public Library, uh, us asking if there was a reading list of recommended readings, right, that we could, you know, provide where a library, right, that's kind of what you do, a standard mediation. Right. And there was a really shattering silence of, and, and, and message that there is no such literature that is centered on the Lenape voice. And so from that awareness that you seeded within us, uh, you know, Joel Whitney and, and Lenape Center really started to think about ha the afterlife, the continuation of what was a really multifaceted project born out of extreme surplus of generosity. So Joe, I, could you speak a little bit more about how this anthology came about? Well, it came about in, in a very beautiful and simple way in that those initial meetings with the Brooklyn Library, and we have many meetings, <laughs> uh, many meetings and many discussions with many people and this, but this was a unique moment because generally those meetings result in some discussion around what kind of programming can we do together and let's start small. And we're like, no, let's go big. Let's start big. We have a big issue here. Mm -hmm. And the Brooklyn Public Library was very different in that they said, they came forward and said, what can we do? And we said, an exhibit? Okay, let's do it. How about an anthology? Let's do it. It was that kind of spirit. You're talking about surplus and generosity. It was very much alive at the Brooklyn Public Library. And it was our first sort of moment of uh, this is really going to happen. This is historic. It's going to happen. And, you know, we become family as a result mm -hmm. of it. Yes, we do. Such a gift. Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered if you might share a little bit of your contribution to this book, which I think is one of the most radical pieces of writing that I have read. Uh, and I think, you know, something that is very much part of your standard repertoire of messaging to non Lenape people. <laughs> heard I was a radical. <laughs> uh, I was contacted by my colleagues. Uh, I've been living in Oklahoma until last summer when I moved to New York so that I could work full time. And so last year, uh, about this time, I was asked to write an essay uh, on the, the suggestion was the forced migration of the Lenape, but that mm. word was too, too light, uh, uh, and and not not deep enough to tell our story, and that's why I renamed it the forced removal of the Lenape, and you all will see that in the anthology. So, 
you know, I did my research. I referenced several books that I've been reading over my career, but also hearing stories from tribal elders uh, and other tribal historians uh, about the removal of the Lenape from Lenape Hokey. Uh, and from their voices, from their perspective, balancing that out with what had been written by historians, uh, uh, colonial military governors, missionaries, uh, a number of people who wrote about the Lenape from the European lens and then in talking with Lenape elders and, and tribal historians, I took the, those perspectives, put them together, and then added my radical approach <laughs> in, the, in the way I worded it. I tried to be, you know, I tried to be somewhat academic and scholarly about it, but I can't, I can't get uh, unemotional about this story. So, yeah. Will you speak a you little bit? To, yeah. Do you want me to go ahead and? I, I would. I would be delighted. I think we all would be delighted. All right. Yeah. I'll. I'll read an excerpt. Wait a minute. Thank you. <clears throat> I like your frames, by the way, both of you. <clears throat> Forced removals of the Lenape the original people. That's in our language. That's really what we call ourselves, Lenape. They were the original people. And I am a modern day descendant of the original people, a chief in the Lenape Nation. I'm an enrolled member of the Delaware Tribe of Indians. Lenape, the original people. This is the name of the people whose culture, language, and life ways were given to them by Keshele Mukong the creator of all things, the spiritual deity of the indigenous people of Lenape Hoking, the land of the Lenape. Lenape ni, I am Lenape. The first removal. In 1524, my ancestors first encountered seemingly godlike people arriving from the east on great ships with sails. First came the Italian explorer Giovanni di Verrazzano, leading an expedition of discovery for the King of France. Then, almost 100 years later, a British explorer, Henry Hudson, who sailed for the Dutch East India Company, arrived. They brought a worldview, a value system, and religion that diminished my ancestors as savages who must be dominated and who lived on land that must be conquered and plundered. The Dutch participated in their first land swindle in 1626 with the so-called Purchase of Manhattan, an exchange of gifts by a small village of foreigners for ostensibly peaceful occupation of a small patch of land was in keeping with the egalitarian lifestyle of the Lenape, who, like many indigenous nations, had no concept of selling land, of conveying title for exclusive occupancy. The land, the water, the sky was not a commodity to be bought, sold, or transferred. It was a sacred gift from the Creator. But soon the, Del the Dutch built a fort on the island of Manahata, our word for the place where they gather wood to make bows. And they named it New Amsterdam. They built a wall around the fort to keep the Indians out. The path along the wall's perimeter became known among the European colonizers as Wall Street. <laughs> it dawned, yeah, that's the origin of the name of New York's Wall Street. It dawned on the Lenape that grand changes were happening that the new arrivals did not intend to assimilate or share occupancy under the Christian doctrine of discovery, later branded as Manifest Destiny. They intended to rid the land of the savages and take control of it. Here, they had come to stay, to dwell on the newfound abundant lands which they would take by conquest and extract resources for the enrichment of Europe's kings, its Catholic papacy, and for themselves. 
Dutch military governors and Christian missionaries wrote extensively about establishing colonies in New Amsterdam and along the coast and the riverways of what is now New Jersey. Massacres by Dutch governor William Willem Kieft's war with the Lenape was horrifically violent. Embedded in the language of these contemporaneous narratives, the Christian doctrine of discovery justified this violence. And then in 1664, the mighty English under King Charles II became the primary European power after forcing the Dutch from Lenape Hoking. At first, the Lenape hoped to engage in an equitable trade of animal furs. But when it came to land ownership claims and their powerful control over the market, the English proved just as ruthless as the Dutch. The Delaware River Valley was re renamed after colonial governor Sir Thomas West. He was Lord de la War, de la War, Delaware. A piece of paper waved before our ancestors represented a royal charter claiming that our land, Lenape Hoking, somehow now belonged to their king from the Mahiakanatuk, named, renamed the Hudson River, and the Lenape Wittuk, Kitane, renamed the Delaware River. The English controlled all trade and commerce. Relations with the Lenape became tenuous. An intentional land swindle by the progeny of William Penn, the infamous walking purchase of 1737, stole hundreds of thousands of acres in Pennsylvania, facing waves of English immigrants, seeking a fresh start in a new land. The Lenape were forced to relocate from their homeland. Our, our ancestors' centuries-long spiritual relationship with our Earth Mother, our Turtle Island, was denied to us. Our ceremonial grounds, sacred sites, and the buried bones of our ancestors were all taken by the forced relocation of the re original people. No longer occupying their sacred homelands, the Delaware were no longer a nation. And behind them, Lenape Hoking loomed under dark clouds of war as they marched toward the setting sun. Thank you. So that's a taste of, of some of the, the power of this publication. And Adrian, I wanted to ask you if you could speak to a little bit to the breadth of relationship and partnership and collaboration that's embodied in this publication. I know in particular, you know, it spans art, poetry, uh, Rebecca Half Lowry's poetry. David Half's paintings, there are reproductions of visual art as well, to uh, the, th the contributions of playwrights, uh, of legal scholars, of human rights activists, um, of, of farmers and seed keepers. It's really an astonishing breadth of material. So can you speak a little bit to how how that comes through, how that's translated into this medium of the book. I think you just did. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> you know, all of, all of this is <clears throat> really necessary to push back against the erasure, the invisibility, which let me state tonight once again is not coincidental, it's by design. And one way to really prove that is think about the, the number of institutions that exist in New York. Mm. Historical societies, libraries, museums, schools, foundations, nonprofits, perhaps the highest concentration of any city in North America. And yet, despite that, it took for us, working with you guys at Brooklyn Public Library, to mount the first Lenape curated exhibit. This is intentional erasure and invisibility. So in order to begin to address this void that for centuries has been the central narrative, and, th and then 
the past decades has been filled sometimes with good intentions coming from historians and archaeologists, sometimes with not so good intentions. It requires this sort of comprehensive approach. Mm. It is multidimensional. If one is to speak of the genocide, one has to speak of the ecocide. Right. And any approach that doesn't try to be as comprehensive is missing a holistic understanding of what occurred. This was a tsunami that arrived in 1609. This was not the beginnings of an example of religiously persecuted refugees coming from abroad. Who arrived in 1609 was the Dutch East India Company. The Dutch East India Company that had already done great damage, horrific actions in Africa, in India, in Southeast Asia. It came with great knowing of how to extract what he considered resources for profit at any cost. And that was only the beginning. Right. And so now we're kind of playing catch up in these efforts of recognition, remediation. Uh, we're understanding the fullness and the gravity of this multifaceted disaster uh, that that began then and if not before. Um, but I, I want to also think about this as a inability to hear and receive the wisdom of Joe, what you call our grandmother's stories. And you open this book with a really uh, potent first person account of your grandmother and what happened on her land allotment. Can you trace some of that for us? That, that's the most difficult. Yeah. That's uh, because that becomes the most personal. Uh, but I will share with you uh, one of the challenges for us today, doing our work in New York City doing our work in the Northeast is that in the public's perception of what happened here is long, long ago. The story of my family, my grandmother, moves forward in time to the early 1900s with the Dawes Act, which allotted lands to surplus lands in Oklahoma to Indian families. And in, within my particular family, that land all became oil producing. And with that came the same terror, terrorism, the same greed, the same avarice that impacted our ancestors hundreds of years earlier here on these shores happened in Oklahoma. As entrepreneurs, shady lawyers, corrupt court systems, clever uh, manipulative people figured out how to have access to those oil-rich lands for oil production. The first um, oil strike in Oklahoma was on the, uh, for Phillips Petroleum Company, Frank Phillips, which was his seventh attempt, was on the allotment of tribal member Anna Davis. That was the beginning of a multi-generational, multi world corporation of oil production. My own grandmother was poisoned 
for access to her land. It wasn't entirely successful because as a child, I could spend time on that allotment land under my mother's care because a certain amount of the acreage remained. No longer oil producing, it became farmlands. We used to, um, we used to take our mother to the allotment with her lawn chair. And we, you know, we were kids. We were like, what are we doing? We're going, to, we're going to the lease, that's what she called it. So we would go to the lease, she'd pull out her armchair, and she would sit. And we kids were like, well, what do we do? And it was, it, it was not until I became an adult that I realized that that land was as close to the memory of her mother who died when she was eight years of age that she had. So she held that land close to her heart. My sister and I continue uh, to care for that land today in Oklahoma. Uh, and you know, as we will always care for that land. But, but the, long, the short of the long story is what happened here continued for our people on those five forced removals all the way into Indian Territory, into Oklahoma. And the violence on tribal lands today continue for many, many people. Uh, so this story is not finished. It's not over. It's as fresh and as alive as it was in 1609 when it impacted our people upon these shores. And in fact, we were kind of poignantly implicated at Greenpoint Branch because that is a new state-of-the-art library branch that whose renovation was funded uh, by, you know, oil, uh, basically reme remediation, pollution remediation money. Um, so, so it was like, you know, more of the same. Yeah. And, and it really, it was a very felt experience. And, and, and yet, the incredibly uplifting experience of walking through that space, we saw the bandolier bag that you are now wearing. And Curtis, I see also on your vest, these beautiful motifs. Curtis, can you speak about what you're wearing and, and what it means, what's its significance? <coughs> well, uh, yeah. So you will, well, first of all, this broadcloth here, I got on a giveaway. So <laughs> I've got this bulk of cloth here, and I'm trying to figure out what to do with it. So I told my daughter to, to uh, oh, you need a microphone? All right. Excuse me, Curtis. Sorry about that. Um, so I told my daughter, I said, you know how to make stuff, so make me a vest. Use this broadcloth. So, so she got it all together, and in her incredible way, what she did is she developed her own interpretation of the sassafras leaf, which is the symbol for uh, our logo, our Lenape Center. So that's what that's about. And I'm just proud to say that my daughter did this work. She's really good at this kind of work. Mm, it's beautiful. And Joe, will you speak to this notion of cultural continu continuance that you are in fact wearing and that you gave of as curator and artist so, so incredibly in this exhibition? what it means to be making on the run during f forced removal, et cetera. So this is a traditional Lenape man's bandolier bag. Um, growing up in Oklahoma, I had never seen one in the real. I had only 
visit, been able to visit these stunningly beautiful creations uh, through photographs and books. In the early, mid-1990s, I was able to visit the collection of George Gustav High, the National Museum of the American Indian. And I saw for the first time ever real bandolier bags. But what was most moving about that moment, reading the provenance of the bags, was the chilling awareness on the notes. H.R. Harrington collected Copan, Oklahoma, 1920. Co collected Oklahoma, Oklahoma, Oklahoma. They were all from my home community in Oklahoma, and they had been held in this collection in New York since the 1920s. So that fired in me, fired me up, and propelled me into the idea that I was going to return the bags to home and to place and to present day use. So I taught myself how to make bandolier bags and I began the process of, of uh, creating bandolier bags. In the exhibit that you're speaking of, we had um, historic bags that were made 1830s, 1850s. Be beautiful, incredible, uh, moving pieces of art. Very modern, very bold, uh, very forward in design. And the thing that I kept thinking about is that these great works of beauty were made in a very perilous time of, of uh, tumultuous change, people on the run. And yet, there was this time, this time that was allocated to the creative process, to under the most dire and threatening circumstances, to return to the eternal truth of creativity and beauty. And to me, that's a, that's a lesson. Mm -hmm. It's a lesson I carry with me today. It's a lesson that I feel that our society needs to be reminded of, mm -hmm. that we all, as I said earlier tonight, have the ability to heal, and that we can heal through the creative acts of creating beauty and good thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And this notion of coming through time and that we're actively adapting, creating. I want to hear a little bit about Nora Thompson Dean, some of the projects that you're currently thinking of her around and creating. Wh whoever wants to speak to this and maybe who she was and what happened when she came to New York as well. Nora Thompson Dean, a member of our tribal community um, who passed away in 1984, who truly is the inspiration for Lenape Center, uh, and a woman in our community that I knew as a child uh, and as a young man. She began in the 19, um, she was a fluent speaker, a traditional uh, uh, keeper of traditional medicine, a traditional woman. She began in the 1970s return trips here to the homeland, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New York, primarily at the imitation of archaeologists and anthropologists uh, to talk about and reclaim through this act of resistance by returning home, the homeland. She visited New York City in nine, and 40 years ago so was to be a visit with the then mayor, Ed Koch. She had been at Seton Hall giving a paper. She traveled into the city. She arrived at City Hall. She was placed in the corridor, seated in the hallway, to await the visit from Mayor Koch. The mayor never showed up. 
But the mayor did present or send out his assistant's assistant who gave her a souvenir pin of the city of New York. The tragedy of that reality is when I think about what could have been culturally accomplished 40 years ago and what change could have been made. But just recently, about a month ago, we at Lenape Center were invited to City Hall. 40 years later, we arrived at City Hall. We saw the actual line of chairs in the rotunda where Nora Thompson Dean was seated. We placed our bandolier bags there. And we went into the rotunda and visited with all the city directors of the city of New York. So it took 40 years to finally get into that room. We would never have been allowed access had it not been for the bravery and the courageous acts of tribal elder visionary Nora Thompson Dean. So I think about how that holds true for all of us in life and that we may not actually be able to accomplish in our lifetime what we would ultimately like to see, but there is this possibility that through our actions, our good thoughts will continue and will be carried by future generations. Yeah, thank you, Wanishi. I, we're going to hear, we're very, very lucky to hear Curtis play music for us. And before we do, I just want to leave the audience here with a bit of what Lenape Center is working on now. Um, what are some of the efforts in the different directions that are, that are ongoing? Um, the work with Cardozo, for example. Um, any, any of you? Curtis, Adrian. Sure. Yeah. Upcoming exhibit at the Morgan Library and Museum to honor the life's work of Nora Thompson Dean, opening June 8th in the yeah. Rotunda. Yes. Yeah. And I knew Nora. Um, I helped hand dig her grave, mm. which was the old way. Uh, she carried with her seeds, seeds that had been passed down over generations to her, and ultimately when she passed, seeds, these seeds were donated to a seed library at the University of Iowa. Corn, it's a blue flint corn. Uh, and so uh, last summer, Joe and Adrian here said, uh, we want you to come to New York and work full time for us. And what we want you to do is, we want you to take, take over an agricultural project that was started with these seeds. And so I came to this farm and I uh, began to work and help to uh, manage and grow corn beans, squash, tobacco, sunflowers, a number of traditional crops. And as I did so, I was manifesting the call of Lenape Center to return to the homeland, to reconnect with the spirit of the land and the water, to commune and communicate with the uh, 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 Mahumsana, the, the grandfathers, those mountains, they have an ancient knowledge. Uh, they all have a living spirit. And I, I connected with that when I showed up every day. And those of you that know about gardening, humbling myself, <laughs> first thing in the morning when I greet all of those plants and the mountains and, 
and give thanks and offer a little tobacco, and then I get down on my knees and I start pulling weeds. Um, but that's what, what I'm doing uh, with Lenape Center, in addition to writing and lecturing, is, uh, is we're going to start another season at the farm, planting these tr traditional crops, and it goes from seed collection to seed rematriation, putting them, them back into the earth. And when I dig my fingers into the soil and I connect with the spirit of the earth, the spirit in those living seeds, the spirit in the water that I put on there to help it grow, I'm connecting deeply and spiritually with the ancestors whose bones are buried beneath the earth too. And I'm connecting after centuries and generations. I am coming back as a descendant and reclaiming my place in the homeland in the most humble of ways is putting these seeds back in the ground, bringing them forth, and then enjoying and appreciating the bounty of that at harvest time and sharing that gift and singing thong songs of thanks and gratitude to the creator and to the ancestors for the opportunity to do that. So I'm going to be doing that again. And it is providing the very healing that Joe talks about, the healing of the historical and generational trauma of that force removal hmm. by coming back and that simple yet organic process of growing these plants has provided healing for me. And Curtis, what arrived in the mail today? <laughs> Speaking of coming back. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've been putting the word out, the network. And uh, I got seeds, uh, squash seeds, and corn seed, which I'll be taking back out. And we're, we're planning for our planting. But I mean, you know, people are finding these seeds and they understand what, they're, what we are doing. Ours is, yes, it's a, it's a, it's a gardening and a farming endeavor, but there's a, it's a sacred task for us because it, it is the most organic way of connecting with those ancestors, the ones that we talk about in this book, the ones who suffered degradation, loss, near genocide, loss of culture. And every time I can say a few words in our language, every time I can offer a little medicine to that field, to that garden, and give thanks, we're bringing it back full circle and it's providing healing for me personally from the generational and historical trauma to our people and we are still dealing with the residual effects of that forced removal in modern day issues of health and, uh, and our condition uh, as a people. And I'm ever so grateful for this opportunity uh, to be back in the homeland and, uh, and doing this work and uh, by the way, the animal life is aware that we're back <laughs> also. I will say that uh, that beautiful blue corn that I was growing, at one point I started seeing some patches of the cornfield that had been trampled down and the corn had been eaten. And when I finally figured out what was going on, it was Mach the bear. <laughs> the bears came out of the woods, found our corn, and started eating on it. And my guess is they were like tasting it and going, wow, we haven't had this variety in a couple <laughs> hundred years. Hey, everybody, come over here. And so I just, you know, I just tried to find a, a balance, you know. Okay, yeah, you can have some of that and just let me have some of this over here and and uh, so we can have another year. But uh, that that has really been a, a great uh, healing endeavor and one that... Uh, I will continue on this journey of healing and wellness. Any final good thoughts before we hear Curtis play for us, sing for us? Are we out of time? Close to? Where's that clock? According to the atomic clock, we are, but oh, I'm okay. sure that everyone here would begrudge us a, another five minutes. 
I'm just ever so grateful that this many people showed up and uh, that the New York Public Library has uh, taken the time to create this uh, opportunity. And uh, I feel, uh, you know, I, I indeed feel welcome. We've got a story to tell. Now, this anthology is going to be available to you. I encourage you to read it and learn. There are so many perspectives, not just the radical history, <laughs> but there's art and poetry and beauty in the telling of our story. And uh, while it may be tragic, we're, we're still here. We're still here. We survived all of that. And our, and our culture has survived the foundation of, in my opinion, all thing, the f foundation of all culture is language. And our Lenape language is still alive and well, thanks to the work of Nora Thompson Dean and many others. Her brother, w Leonard, was one of my principal mentors. And her adopted nephew, Jim Remender, who has created an online talking dictionary of the Lenape language. So as long as we can say a few words in our Lenape language, as long as we can remember the ancestors, and as long as we can stand on the, on the soil and, and, and give thanks as we stand on Lenape Hoking, we are still here, and our story will continue, and it's our obligation to tell our children and grandchildren about this and make a way for them to continue this. Our obligation is to the ancestors and to our grandchildren. We're just a pathway right now along this timeline. Thank you. Wanishi, and maybe you can all and by teaching us this very important word in Lenape. Wanishi. Mm -hmm. Wanishi. Wanishi. Means thank you. Wanishi. Means thank you. Wanishi. Wanishi. Curtis, yeah. take okay. it Sing away. us out, Curtis. Sing us out. All right. Sing us out of the room. Let's go. Yo ho we ho yo ho we ho yo ho we yo we yo ho we ho yo ho we ho yo ho we yo we ya we landi ek lena pe yok ho we yo we. Yahweh, 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 Yahwe